103.9 FM, WOZO Radio, Knoxville. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. Hello and welcome to the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio, 103.9 LPFM right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Today is Sunday morning, July 18th, 2021. I am Larry Rhodes, or Doubter5, and as usual, we have our co-host, Wombat, on the line with us. Hello, Wombat. Did you say it's July 18th already? It's it going to be is. that all day long. The year gone. Yeah. Wow. Hey, hey, hey. I'm enjoying it. It's been a good year so far. Yeah, very good. Okay, and with us today, we have George uh, Two and a Half from Brooklyn, or originally from Brooklyn. Hello, George. Hi. Hello, everybody. And Dread Pirate Higgs. How are you there? From Canada. And John Richards from England, UK, Hello. England. I'll get it right here. One right. of those places it has to be yeah. one of them. <laughs> Hello. Digital Free Thought Radio Hour is a talk radio show about atheism, free thought, rational thought, humanism, and the sciences. And conversely, we'll also talk about religion, religious faiths, gods, holy books, and superstition. Well, but what's our topic for going to be for today? We're going to be talking about double standards, why they're dangerous, and why they're also really annoying. But before we get into the meat <laughs> and potatoes, let's throw it up to our own Dread Pirate Higgs for our weekly invocation. Okay. I'm going to put it on my hat. Give me a second. Nice, 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 nice. Also, Larry, the way how I think about UK and England, it's sort of like there's parts of Ireland. There's Our noodly lord who art in a colander. <laughs> El Dante be thy noodles. Thy blood be rum, thy sauce be yum, with meat as it is with vegetables. Give us this day our garlic bread, and forgive us our cussing, as we forgive those who cuss against us. And lead us not into ketoism, but deliver us some carbs. For thine are the noodles, and the sauces, and the grog, whenever and ever. Amen. We're going to wait for Dread Pirate to get his head, headphones back on. I'm just taking up some dead air time. There we go. Great. Hey, while we're on the subject of geography, John Richards, how you been? And do you have a preference for UK or England or is either fine? Well, it's a very confusing place, thanks to the history. Yeah. We've got, we've got four countries okay. and we're all in one. So UK is the umbrella term, mm -hmm. but... If we don't want to include Northern Ireland, right. we can call it Great Britain <laughs> for the remaining three. <laughs> and I'm actually located in England. Okay. So there you go. Pick the bones out of that. So you said four countries. Is it like Scotland, Ireland, and a bit of France? Like what's the fourth country there? It's England, Wales, Scotland, and oh. Northern Ireland. Oh, Wales is its own thing? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Don't tell the Wales that. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. They don't want you to forget that. Yeah, exactly. So, George Brown, how you been? I, I've been good. I've been good. Uh, although, I mean, I mean <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, I, I like good coffee, and I... Um, I, I'm a particular fan of a brand of coffee named Pete's right. that was brought to Berkeley, California by a man named Alfred Pete. His okay. company has been bought and sold a number of times since then. It's still great coffee. It's so expensive, I can't afford it. Well, I, and it's become universal in a way. I bumped into the Pete's route driver yesterday in the parking lot of my supermarket and she handed me a bag of coffee get out of town for free no no she handed me a bag of coffee that had been roasted the day before in alameda california so here i am sitting in rural tennessee drinking my very favorite coffee from berkeley <laughs> so i'm very happy yeah very nice. very nice very nice that's that's a good day that's a good day yeah uh, it's a good day Dread Pirate Higgs, I want to see how you've been. And what's your shirt say? Well, uh, my shirt is a uh, tribute to Douglas Adams. Okay. Life, and the universe, and everything. 42. Yeah. That's, that's a Venn diagram. 42. Bag. Very and nice. there's the Babel fish there. I see it. Yeah. yeah. And they're flying yeah, dolphins. Yeah, dolphins. Yeah. dolphins. Make sure a good there. radio. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I've, I've been doing pretty good. Um, I think I, I might have mentioned last week 
uh, or, or I guess it would have been last week, uh, we had another meeting for the uh, uh, the International Pacifarian Captain's Conclave. And so we're just cool. working on some, um, some scripts so that we can present it to our foreign affairs ministers and see if we can get a delegation to the UN for World Truce 2021. Nice, nice, nice. Also, you got a picture that yeah, you, don't, you don't have to share it on the show because I, yeah. there's a lot of personal inf information on it. But yeah. would you mind just telling us about it? Well, sure. Um, so, you know, in, in struggling with the Insurance Corporation of BC, who's responsible for official um, identification, government issued identification. Uh, they wouldn't let me wear my tricorn. They wouldn't let me wear a colander. They wouldn't let me wear a bandana, which they allow as a, a hair accessory that depicted uh, the symbol of uh, the uh, flying spaghetti monster on it. But uh, the second time I went in with that uh, bandana, I had concealed underneath a temporary tattoo. So when they were giving me grief, uh, they said, well, would you be willing to, you know, turn, turn that uh, hair accessory around so that the symbol isn't on it? And I said, where is that in your policies? And so she started to go on and giving me grief. And so I said, look, I'm going to make this incredibly easy for you. And I took it off and her eye and her jaw just kind of dropped. Good for her. And, and she went, uh, okay, let's let's do this. <laughs> and so, uh, four weeks because, later, because four there, weeks was later tattoo, I, there was a tattoo there. That's, that's exactly right. So, right, right, right. <laughs> um, so yeah, so now I have, uh, my, uh, personal health services card and my driver's license depicted with a, you know, a flying spaghetti monster symbol there on my head. Nice. And I have additional, uh, tattoos that I'm going to offer up to anyone who wants them. I'll mail it to wherever they need to go. If you want to try and get your driver's license with a tattoo, um, these things come off in two seconds with a little yeah, bit. Of here's oil. the critical okay. question. What color is the tattoo? It's just black. Yeah. It won't work on me, but I appreciate, <laughs> it. I appreciate the offer. it might, you know, it, it uh, might actually stand out a bit. <laughs> why can't we get white ones? Where, where are the white tattoos? Well, you I'm know, I, I could certainly do that. <laughs> the, the, the design is, the design is in the thing and, and they can just print them off. But, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Hit me up. Hit me up. Oh, Dread. Uh, uh, tattoos yeah, are racist now then, are they? Yeah. <laughs> oh, if they let the white tattoos through and it was like, Oh, that's fine. That's fine, sir. Please line up. It's totally yeah, good. Then. Yeah. Uh, daughter five. I want to check up on you. How you been up? Oh, you're on mute. My buddy. Just fine. Um, I haven't had my motorcycle a lot lately, but playing the computer games and going to the park and conversing with people, uh, to some extent, nice. uh, mostly online. Conversing but, with people, going outside, going to parks. What is this like? Oh, is COVID over already? How? How? Pretty how much. Uh, at least for the summer, it may come back in a month or so. But right now, it's it's. I'm, take, I'm striking while the iron is hot, as it were. Nice. I'm trying to enjoy some outdoor time. I've been yep. enjoying some outdoor stuff too. I've been playing a lot of disc golf recently, and uh, yesterday we had a tournament. I got so there are cards that break up different groups of people that show up. I got third place on my card, and four, tied for fourth among all cards that were in my skill level, which is novice. So I was really, what was really the happy. prize you won? You don't get prizes in disc golf. The prize is playing disc golf. That's the, uh, that's, okay. the key. that's the key. That's the key. But yeah, yeah, really, really fun. Had a good time out there. I didn't lose a single disc, which is, well, you know, only let me thing. tell you this. Talk to I me. once, uh, I was taking karate for a long time. It took for about eight years. Hmm. And, uh, early on I was a brown belt and I went to, a. a karate weekend where they went outside and they did exercises and, and tournaments <laughs> and stuff. And I won first place in the Brown belt division. Hey, they did not give me trophies. I stopped at a trophy shop on the way home and bought one. <laughs> so there's always that option. There's always the option of buying your own trophy. Uh, when I buy my own third place trophy, though, that's the craziest part. Yeah. Okay. But that's good. I'm glad you won it. So today we're going to be talking about double standards, why they're dangerous, and why they're annoying. Why I want to talk about it is because we had a really interesting conversation last week. Uh, very nice guy who was on. His name was Isaiah. But I think we had um, two stages of the talk that we were having with them. One where we asked them, you know, essentially how you're doing. And then the other one, why do you believe? And I think when you get to the why you believe and how he came to know that his God is real, uh, he was a Christian. It was like a, a shopping list of every single red flag that I think most atheists are familiar with. I want to yeah. believe it. 
that's why it's true. Uh, I was angry for why I was an atheist. So that's why Christianity it works true. for me. It works for me. It makes it me practical. comfortable. I had a personal experience that God talked to me, but I can't test it. I know it sounds right. crazy, but I just believe that it's true. And I, in the back of my head, I was thinking, okay, well, let's, let's try to just move on. Cause I don't want to make this a debate. So uh, we started talking about other countries and I said, Hey, you know, Sweden is, you know, has a lot of atheists in it. And I was there. I lived in Sweden for like about a year and a half doing research there. That's where I came out as an atheist. It was just there, it was a perfect climate for it. And I think he jumped on that. and was like, you know what? Eight, uh, people always say Sweden is not an atheist country. Statistical proof and data here says 76% of this from this global report. I'm like, man, I wish you had this much enthusiasm for statistics for, as you did for, for your end of one test on God where you, yeah. that you know you can't test. And it stopped him there. And I was like, let's talk about double standards because I think even if it doesn't convince him to change his mind for the better, or at least ask himself some serious questions, because he left the group since then. Um, I do think it would be important for us to discuss why double standards are both dangerous, but also really, you know, annoying from an atheist perspective when, we, when mm -hmm. we've seen enough of them. And that's mm -hmm. not to say that I'm not immune to them either. I'd like for them to be called out. But uh, John Richards, I would say this. What's your, do you have a single standard for knowing if things are true or not? And if you can share that with us, if not, let's talk about it. But we'll start with you. Do you, what, how do you know if things are true or not? Shareable, repeatable observations. I dig it. Yeah. Shareable and repeatable observations. Okay. John Richards, I'm not putting you on the spot, but you know, in this book called the Bible, there was like 12 repeated stories that are kind of closely related to each other. Would that be enough for you to then uh, believe that a God is real? If you had 12 stories that all more or less kind of said the same thing, or at least four well, stories. <laughs> I know the Bible calls them witnesses, mm. but unfortunately modern usage of the word means that we've got to have a person who we can put in a witness box and question <laughs> in order to see whether their stories are consistent, whether they keep to the same account. And we can't do that to these guys who all died 2000 years ago. So mm -hmm. I, I don't accept that they're witnesses. What we have here are very old reports. And unfortunately for the believers in this particular story, the earliest surviving written accounts of those reports date from no closer to the events that they claim to report than 30 years, mm -hmm. some of them much, much further apart. But this means that it's highly likely that the reports were not written at the time of the events. Certainly they don't survive if they were. So therefore, it's probable that these are hearsay <laughs> accounts, you know. The, in fact, it's another generation 30 years later. It's like you saying to me, uh, can I prove that my grandfather carried Queen Victoria in the first car on the Isle of Wight? And I can tell you that he told me that before I can't he died. tell if this is an outrageous statement or not. Like, I have so little understanding of geography. In, that's that's my silly see? misstatement. Yeah, yeah. There you go. So I imagine there it didn't go. happen. <laughs> well, yeah. You're, you're going to have to choose whether to believe me or not, aren't you? Right. So it's, it's exactly like that. John, before we go to someone else, I would like to ask you then, if you said it's shareable and repeatable as your standard of evidence, is there a number of people that we could bring on the show who say they've talked to God that would make you believe that God talks to people? If we can repeat that enough times with enough different people. No. <laughs> okay. Because you... I, I, I need to be able to share it myself. Oh, so you have to experience it yourself for it to be true. Well, 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 I have to know how I could experience it for myself. I, I, you know, I, if you told me that I can see a particular star, I'd mm -hmm. have to know where to look. You know, I have to go to the find the right telescope or something. Okay, okay. But I, I need I need to know that at least it's possible for me to be able to repeat that observation. This is very interesting. So I have I have a standard. I don't know if it's the best one, but I do like the idea of like. Um, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, right? Mm -hmm. And so even if I had a billion different stories and my own personal experience of talking to a God, that's such an incredible thing that I'd probably want 
and even a higher standard of evidence than just people repeating the same story and sharing it with me and my own personal experience before I am convinced yeah. that a God yeah. exists. Because how am I supposed yeah. to know that wasn't a demon or just a hallucination that we're all experiencing at the same time too? Exactly. So many other things. If you go back a few hundred years, you would find everybody who would tell you that they believed that the sun went round the earth. So <laughs> what we have here is the Vox Populis fallacy. Okay. You know, it, it, there's, there's no number of people who can prove something to be true. Now, I do like shareable and repeatable because I like science stuff, but I would say like that was, that's a tool to get me towards the standard of evidence that I need to believe in something. Mm. But the standard is I need a, as much evidence to support the claim at the same standard of how incredible that claim is. And for mundane stuff, like I went to the grocery store, I don't need a lot as much proof as say for God exists because that's a much more mm -hmm. extraordinary thing. Drip Pirate, I would love to hear from you. Do you have a standard yeah. for knowing if things are true or not? Well, it's it's, it's on the same level with uh, with yours, uh, and it's an explanation for anything that requires the least amount of assumptions. Oh. So you know, employing Occam's razor essentially, right? Yes, perfectly and, stated. Yes. Yeah. Inside, inside, aside to that is uh, is Hitchens' razor. Oh. Uh, which says that which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. I like so, um, you know, in certain, when we were talking to Isaiah and I agree that he was a very nice guy, mm -hmm. but uh, he made some pretty outrageous claims and offered absolutely no evidence to support that. Mm -hmm. And so I could have examples? just as don't easily just... dismiss that. Well, when don't he don't said he heard, he heard, a, you know, he, he knew it was Jesus Christ that spoke to him in his head. Right. And just to take it on face value without suggesting that perhaps there is an alternate explanation, right. such as maybe you're tired, maybe you were hypnagogic, or you were no, you were just, you know, in that transitional phase between waking and sleeping. Yeah, maybe um, you were certainly I've people. heard uh, certainly I've heard voices and I've had, you know, odd experiences or the sense of presence in the room. Um, but that's actually quite easily explained uh, through psychology as, uh, you know, that hypnagogic state. And um, I see uh, John there waving his hand. But yeah, so um, <laughs> Occam's, Occam's razor, definitely, and Hitchens razor. Yeah, I, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to put in here that Occam is a village about 40 minutes drive. To Get out of town. Yep, yep. <laughs> wow. And, and that's, that's where William of Ockham lived and uh, had his thoughts about razors. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know it was a place. So I cool. didn't know it was a place either. He, cool. he was looking for a close shave. Oh, yes. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> With the, no assumptions related. So dread part, I loved your answer because <laughs> Occam's razor is typically misnomered or miscategorized as the simplest answer is the right, correct right. one. And that is right. not true. That's not what it even says in the rule. It's the one with right. the least number of assumptions tends right. to be not always, but tends to be the, the, the most true yep. result. And right. when you make a, an assumption mm -hmm. that, Oh, well, this is God who's talking to me. It's Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's the voice says so that's still an assumption, even though yes. the voice told you it was Jesus. And I was like, when I heard that, I was like, Oh, what a nice guy. Yeah. It's like <laughs> saying the Bible is true because it says so. Right. 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 You know, I, hmm. we, yeah, in, right. in atheism, we have, like a, we have a saying, yeah, a call tautology where it's like, I can say everything I write on this napkin is true because it's, it says so on this napkin and I can share right. it to somebody and people be like, that's not the case. Well, it's like, then why is it true when the Bible does it? It's like, ah, uh, right. right. Okay. Uh, we'll go next. George Brown, how do you know if something's true or not? Well, how do I know? <laughs> we, our topic is double standards, and I'm, it's on my mind. Um, but but let me let me digress for a moment to Occam's Razor because sure. uh, pe people have been. It, it's been coming up to my consciousness lately. Uh, Occam's Razor, and I decided to read definitions of Occam's Razor, and you know. None of the definitions talk about Occam's razor. They talk about what the principle is, but not why it's called a razor. Okay. And, that, that you know, work. so I, I'm always looking behind the story, and I can't find the behind in this one. Is it a Gillette? Is it a straight razor? Is it a Norelco? What kind of razor are we talking about? What is the story of the razor? So are we going to give a serious answer or a joke? John, you want to tackle this one? Yeah. Oh, he's busy. He's doing a cricket league match. All right. How about this? Uh, Larry, would you mind giving yeah. the answer for why it's called a razor? 
Well, it cuts out extraneous uh, entities, or extraneous okay. options if they're not needed. Uh, if you've got a perfectly good answer, basically, if you've got a perfectly good answer or something that explains the phenomena, you don't need to put anything else in there exactly. to uh, try to explain it further if it doesn't. It, you know, it, it, not necessary. Well, you see, I, I always want to know why something is called what it's named. Well, and now that we told you, oh wait, ha, hey, there we go. Uh, John Richards, take your. But I didn't off. mention my. I didn't mention my uh, double standards thing. And I, I just want to put this out and uh, as quickly as I can. Here in Tennessee, uh, we've been having a lot of suppression of truth on a on an official level going on lately. You know, it's been in the news in a number of places that are not Tennessee, it's gotten out there that, um, for instance, the state, I believe it's the health. George, I know you want to talk about fascism, but we asked you, how do you know if something's true or not true? We're going to stay on, we're going to try oh, to I stay focused. It's how do whether you know I believe it or not. <laughs> okay, okay. Whether I know it's true or not is, um, I mean, in my own personal life, is uh, whether it stands the test of whatever I tested with. So okay. testing. And, uh, hopefully, yeah. Testing, hopefully, verification, repeatability. I like testing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I like the scientific method if I understand what it is, and um, uh, hope hopefully I will be able to discern it and and to have doubts about myself that maybe I don't. Not bad. You know? Science has room for I don't know. Dread pirate. What do you got? Yeah. So in philosophy, a razor is a principle or rule of thumb that allows one to eliminate or shave off unlikely explanations for a phenomena or avoid unnecessary actions. Dred, what I love about you is you just say that from the top of your head, staring right in the yes. camera. I totally know you weren't reading that. John Richards, what do you have? Did you want to add to that? Well, I was just going to say that I, I don't think Occam's principles were described as a razor until long after he was dead. Uh, I think it may have been by Bertrand Russell or somebody quite modern who uh, dis described it, gave it the name a razor when, mm. when Occam's work was being, you know, reinvestigated. Nice. So Occam I... didn't know. That's William, William of Occam. He William of Occam. Yeah, yeah, he didn't know that he was coming up with a razor. No. <laughs> he was a priest or something. What, what was his job? I forgot. Yeah, he was a monk or a, a friar or something, yes. Nice, yeah. nice. His job was thinking, and you can tell, right? Doubter Five, yes, I'd yes. love to know. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you. How do you know if something's true, and do you use multiple standards to get there, or would you like just one? Well, yeah, I do. Uh, if, if I'm looking at a, a news story or something, I will check or cross-reference it with other news sources. If, uh, if the... Um, a statement aligns with what I know is reality, that helps. Uh, if it's something that I can personally test, I do. If it's repeatable, if somebody else has tested it and I get their ver their verification of it, it helps. Also, uh, I don't credit, I don't generally any credit any supernatural claims right? because it's above testing. Uh, the, the very nature of a supernatural claim uh, uh, makes it above testing. Mm -hmm. And until such time as we can test them, you know, why should I believe that they're real? Right. Uh, and it, they're also extraordinary claims. You know, they're, they're way above the ordinary. Right. And as a, I, I don't know who said it originally, but I believe it was Carl Sagan that most people attribute it to supernatural. I mean, uh, extraordinary, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And right. uh, uh, stories in a book are not extraordinary evidence. And what I'm making the point is it's not, we're all saying the same thing. We're all saying we don't just care about evidence. We care about a standard of evidence, right? right. And that standard of evidence needs to meet the, 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 the extraordinariness of the claim. And we can get there by testing, making sure it's shareable, repeatable, that we can actually test it, that we can actually investigate it, that it doesn't make a number of assumptions that we can't test. Like all of these go into the aspects of how we begin to know things. And if we can't hit that standard, we will fall back on the scientific approach when you don't know something and you say, I don't know because that is a totally valid thing to say until you do know yep. something. And right. what we found 
as an interesting component with Isaiah is that when he was faced with the I don't know, his default position was, well, it has to be God. <laughs> We're asking him why. He's like, well, right. and he default to a bunch of other dangerous standards of knowing things are true, such as, well, it makes me comfortable. Well, I want it to be true. Well, it just makes sense to me. And, and that is both potentially very dangerous as well as pretty annoying because you know we've we've seen that a number of times but i imagine uh we can probably handle that in the second half of the show we can, we can talk about why it's annoying us why it irks us doubter five would you like to take us out and we'll come back and we'll, we'll handle that subject well sure this is the digital free thought radio hour we're on wozo radio 103.9 lpfm right here in knoxville tennessee and we'll be right back after this short break 103.9 FM, WOZO Radio, Knoxville. Hello, and welcome back to the second half of the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. I'm Daughter 5, and we're on WOZO Radio 103.9 LP FM, right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Today is Sunday morning, July 18th, 2021. Let's talk for a moment about the Atheist Society of Knoxville, or ASK. Founded in 2002, we're in our 19th year. ASK has over a thousand members and we have meekly, meekly, not so meekly sometimes, uh, Zoom meetings every week during COVID, but we also meet in person at Barley's Taproom and Pizzeria in the old city in Knoxville out on the patio. You can find us online on Facebook, meetup.com or knoxvilleatheist.org, or just Google Knoxville Atheist. It's just that simple. By the way, if you don't live in Knoxville, you should still go to Meetup and look for an atheist group in your town. Don't find one? Start don't one. Start one. <laughs> well, but where do you want to pick up? We're going to be talking about why double standards annoy us, and we'll go around and talk about stories of double standards annoying us. John Richards, I think you have an example that you'd like to present. It's topical, too. It's this very day... Our Prime Minister, <clears throat> what's his name? I have oh, no yeah. idea. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we won't Laura mention something. Yeah, maybe we Laura? won't mention him for fear of being sued or something. <laughs> he's a public he's a public figure, he's a politician. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's Boris. Yeah, Boris Johnson. So he's recently been tested as positive for COVID. Now, he's had it before, and he's double-vaxxed, so he's not going to die or anything, but because he's tested positive, he can transmit it. Hmm. And the same thing has happened, coincidentally. We've got a new health minister. The previous one had to resign in disgrace because he was caught fondling his girlfriend in his office. <laughs> but, his uh, girlfriend, though. His girlfriend, though, right? Not his wife? Yeah, or, like, was he married? No. No, no, this is going yes, adults. Yes, yes. That's, Consensual that's adults? What's the problem there? All right, there I right. Well, yeah. well the, the problem is that um, he was supposed to be socially distancing. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so this, is, this, is, this is double standards, isn't it? Anyway, to get back to today's story, the, the Prime Minister and the new Health Secretary, who have both tested positive, mm. should be, according to their own rules, in isolation for 10 days, mm. which is what happens to you and I if, if we are positive, if, if we've been tracked and traced by the app uh, as being having been in contact with somebody who is positive. Correct. That's how it works. But... What they've done is said, well, this doesn't apply to us. <laughs> we, can, we can go through this new system of testing ourselves every day, which is a pilot system that we have access to, but you don't. Mm. So that's a double standard. Mm. I'm and, different, and, and I have a different set of rules. You follow yes. this set of rules. Yeah, I can see exactly. that. Hmm. And he has to he has to fondle himself now. <laughs> that one's that one's gone. <laughs> George Brown, did you have a story you want to bring up? It sounded like you wanted to talk about some hypocrisy. Hey, can I just well, uh, yeah. <laughs> can I just finish that story because go for it, go for it, they've, John. They've climbed down. They said, okay. We will self-isolate. Why is it a bad thing to take a 10-day vacation? Like, that's that's the, the one of the best things that's happened during COVID is just, oh, I can remote work. I can take time off and everything's cool. Yeah, yeah, take a break. It's like So the media castigated yes, them and, and they gave in. Yeah. 
This is the dumbest thing possible. Anyway, uh, George Brown. Triple standard. Well, I, you know, I, I feel like I live in bizarro world here in, in in a flyover state. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been a coastal person in, in my life. I've lived on the East Coast. I've lived on the West Coast. Here I am in the Bible Belt, in in the land of the believers, and. Um, a phrase that pops up every once in a while out of Christianity is, quote, the truth will set you free. Am I wrong? Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, so now there is a war on truth going on in my state at the, at the governmental level. Um, I see politicians are trying to exterminate the truth legally. So uh, I forget her, her exact title, but the, like the Secretary of Health for the state was mysteriously fired. And vaccination encouragement is, seems to be expunged here and there officially. So if I've got it right, the state health department has been um, uh, told that they cannot encourage vaccinations of any kind right now. The, the, the official in charge of health of healthcare for the state hmm. has been fired for being truthful about vaccination for COVID-19. And uh, we have uh, the denial of truth about black history so what, what's what's this thing called? I forget. There's a name for it. Gaslighting. How's that? Gaslighting. Yeah. What's that? Gaslighting. Gaslighting. Yeah, spin. Re rewrite history. Wagging the dog. Yeah. Rewrite. How much of it? Rewrite history, but but really stomp on the truth. It's like when the truth uh, doesn't play by the rules that we are familiar with and make mm. us comfortable, mm. we will deny it to the point right. of, you know, firing people, you know, obliterating the truth, whatever it is. I would like to lay on this. There's very rarely a comfortable truth, but almost every lie is comfortable, delicious, and just the most wonderful thing possible. And so what you have to learn to deal with is like a little bit of discomfort because that's where truth is. It's not out of your way to hurt you, but it is not comfortable. It's like laying on an iron bed sometimes. It's just like, oh, I need that little bit of discomfort. Dr. Five, what do you got? Oh, I was getting back to the double standard thing. <clears throat> I love it when the, I'm talking to him and I talk about like the Big Bang Revolution or something, age of the earth. And he says, there's no evidence for that. That's their comeback. And oh my to me, I'm thinking, you, your whole life is built around a, a book whose stories have no evidence to back <laughs> right, it up. Right. But as soon as I bring up verifiable you know, uh, scientific information, you claim there's no evidence for it. And that's so when everyone puts is on important to you now, right? And not then. I, that, I that's double that. standard. That just, just drives me crazy. It drives me mm -hmm. crazy what happens too. At that point? My hair falls out. What happens? My hair turns gray. Larry. I get a gray hair. That's what happens. I get a gray hair. <laughs> that's what happens. Doubter five. I get that a lot too. I've been in labs. I've been in chemical labs with other scientists, and I'll bring up, "Oh, wow, you have a." Uh, uh, corgi. Those used to be wolves. Isn't that weird? And they'll be like, no, the <laughs> dogs never used to be wolves. They, they were just always kinds of dogs. And I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? It's like, yeah, evolution is a real. I'm like, we have documented breeders that can tell you how, what, what strains well, these dogs came from. Animal like, that's not even goes back hundreds of years. Like that's, that's recent. That's very recent. Like, no, they're always corgis. I'm like, how? You're a scientist in my lab. Get... <laughs> I'm a... It's the third pillar of biology. How do you not understand evolution? It's absolutely imperative that you do. But when you challenge their God belief with the evolution claim, that's when they put on like, well, you know, carbon dating isn't as, as, as comparable to like phosphorus or ISO 32. And I read in this Nature magazine, it's like, I'm glad you have all this skepticism for this. I wish you had applied it to the God belief because at this you're taking for face value. Whereas everything else, you have the leagues of data to disclaim mm -hmm. it, which is great because that's a right. scientific process. Mm -hmm. It's good to be skeptical, but apply that to your God belief and see where it'll lead you. Dr. Uh, Dread Pirate Higgs, what do you got? 
Um, well, I was going to say here in in Canada as well. There's also a, a a double standard, and I I know what I'm about to say is probably not the popular thing to say, but uh, you know, given the recent uh, findings in residential schools, um, but it has been a longstanding um, policy of both federal and provincial governments to treat Indigenous peoples as a as a, almost as a, a distinct and separate race um, that uh, have, you know, certain privileges and um, considerations that the rest of the population do not have. And I find that is a, is a perfect example of a double standard. Right. If, if we're supposed to be all equal and we're all equal citizens under the law, um, that's the way it ought to be. Um, not, not set it up as you're non-Indigenous and you are Indigenous and we are going to treat you this way and we're going to treat you the other way, you know? Yeah, and because um, you're not part of the system, we get to take advantages, certain advantages of you that... Yeah, well, I mean, you, well. You, you think about this. I mean, uh, the, the the idea of blood and soil, of course, is is really a, an antiquated and outdated mode of thinking. It goes back to tribalism, yep. um, and it's a failed a failed epistemology, really. Um, I am as much every atom in my body is, you know, uh, from the soil here. I'm as indigenous as anyone alive, and um, it it. It's a. It just seems like an arbitrary uh, distinction that um, is not really warranted, and that's kind of my feeling about it. That's interesting. I mean, I know I know terrible things have happened to Indigenous people uh, by virtue of them identifying and their culture and all the rest of it, but I don't think it's uh, um, the collective guilt of every uh, you know non-Indigenous person that has to now bear. The weight of it and uh and you, you if you know what i mean i would only i would only argue and this is probably a, a much deeper topic for our for another time but if there are systemic barriers inhibiting quality of life for a particular group of people and mm -hmm. they can't get a voice because they're not claimed to be a citizen or or non-indigenous or whatever that that's troublesome because now you have a a, a you're being put essentially in a group that you don't have consent to get out of so that you can seek the help that you need to support the group that you're in. And it puts everything at a double standard that's very strict. So it mm -hmm. should be, it should be in a sense like, hey, sort of like, and I'll throw this out, it should be like a voluntary system of like, hey, if you wanna be considered this, you can, you can use this label. But for the most part, we are a system that helps everybody equally. And right. regardless whatever label you have, we will dish out the help. Sort of like yeah. if I go play disc golf, I have a choice of being in the novice league or the amateur or like the pro level if i want to go into pro but i have the choice of picking which one and i can choose the level of competition i want to be in and i'll get rated based on the one that i consensually chose to yeah. label whatever label i picked but yeah. it's a very complicated issue john what it is got? it is well i've got something that segues on nicely from what dread was telling us because you guys will know that pretty pretty much that um England was the, the football team was in the final of the Euros last yes, night. What's that, that mean? What's that mean? What's that mean? And, and, and what is that? A, is there any American that can explain that to me? What is it? What does that mean? They're in the finals. <laughs> finals of what? Play, uh, no, the soccer. Football, uh, Volleyball? Soccer. soccer. Something. Something. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. It, it, oh, that's a, a game that's kicking the ball. Okay. And you ask questions about disc golf and you're like, oh, I don't know what this yeah. is. Okay. Yeah. What's soccer? <laughs> Well, it, it's like it's like your um, your game. What do you call it? Not rugby. Foosball. Uh, Foosball. <laughs> okay, if you like, but you're not allowed to pick the ball up. So it, okay. it's really just, just the feet. You see. Okay. So anyway, England was in this, and we did very well. We came through all the different stages, winning, winning, winning. Only conceded one goal in the whole of the event, and then it got to the final, and we were beaten by Italy. And unfortunately, it went to a penalty shootout, which is a horrible way to end a football match. But three of our players were coloured. They're British, you know, but they had ethnicity that wasn't deemed to be going back enough centuries by some people. And although they'd supported them throughout the whole of the winning stages of the event, because they missed a couple of penalties, horrible racist remarks were made 
on the internet. And we also have a thing over here, which is called Thought for the Day, which is a little slot on Radio 4 in the mornings where we get some religious person, usually a Christian, who gives us a little homily. And so we had this person come on at the beginning of the week, and she was saying how horrible it was, the racist remarks that have been expressed about our, some of our footballers. Everybody was agreeing with her, but she ended up saying, I, as a Christian, <laughs> know better than this sort of thing. So she did a little bit of propaganda for her group sure, at the end, sure, sure, not sure. realizing that although she disliked racism, she didn't mind a bit of religionism. Whoa, right. interesting. So yeah, two True. examples there, like, hey, we, we are good enough to be a part of your team during all the winning games that led us to the finals, but when we miss a penalty kick, now you have the standard where we're all essentially less than human. And then the remarks from a, a thought giver was essentially like, hey, I'm not racist, but as a member of a society that's probably more responsible for the systemic segregation of people and destruction of human lives than any other group, and probably the most highest successful team in terms of division <laughs> across and all of humanity. I don't like these terms. These, this actually makes me upset. It seems weird that there's that colorful um, perspective on themselves. Yeah, double standards are annoying. Hypocrisy is annoying. Dread Pirate, what do you have? Yeah. Um, just remarking actually on that game, uh, I believe the captain of the Italian team, uh, when he pulled the shirt of uh, one of the black players there and pulled him to the ground, yeah, yeah. I mean, we were aghast that he yeah. didn't get a black card. Or you know what I mean? And I, or a red card, sorry. Uh, I or just black booted, booted right out of the game. Yes, um, yes. Sure. You know what I mean? Because it was such a glaring uh, case of obvious, yes. you know, foul. Inter uh, very, very obvious foul. Yes. And uh, I wondered, of course, I was thinking yeah. because of sort of this, uh, you could see that there was this sort of inherent racism in there, that if it had been another player uh, who was not black, if he would have been given a red card. You know what I mean? Uh, George George Brown, I, these guys are talking about yes, soccer. Um, Help us bring us back to America. No, I can't. I can't talk about <laughs> soccer, but I <laughs> I want to um, follow up on on what um, Dread Pirate was was talking about and and preface that with saying that there have been times in my life when I have looked to Canada as an inspiration. You know, like the guys who got it right. <laughs> you know, when America is so all screwed up, we have this beacon of sanity to the north. <laughs> <laughs> And um, that's wishful thinking, I guess. Um, this this business with the Indian schools, frankly, has made me just heartsick. And um, well, that wasn't all um, of Canada. That was just the Catholics. Yeah, the Catholic, Catholic <laughs> well, residential schools. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, getting getting on to psychology of all this, um, you know, I think what I hear a lot of is us versus them. We're the good guys, they're the bad guys. God is on our side, mm. not theirs. And the minister, of course, the, the religious leader on that side is saying, God is on our side. Double standard. Right. Um, we, we tend to be generalizers. We have to be. Animals are generalizers. We, we As a survival instinct. Do. It's been it's very, a, well, whatever we it, we try to make sense out of the world and we we compartmentalize our knowledge and um, and so people have a tendency, many people to have in and out in group out group. And there's a tendency to put the people who threaten our beliefs into that out group. That's, um, you know, du the double standards, you, you, you just, you watch them come. They, yeah. they come in waves. We're, we're in, in waves now. Yeah, we're in it's waves now. Something. And I will want to make yeah. a point, like, you know, we're a room full of atheists right now. We're all most likely subject to our own special double standards, and we should be aware of that. Indeed. Like, and I yeah. want them called out when I see them. That's the main thing that I think hopefully differentiates me from someone who's grown accustomed to their double standards and are comfortable. I want them called out for me and I want to be able to change so that I have mm -hmm. one single standard yeah. or most optimal possible. Dred, go for you. Yeah, um, so we've got a comment here from uh, Data's Trading Room. 
uh, which I which I really like. It's a, he says it's always like that. When the team is winning, we are winning. When the team is losing, they are losing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like it. John, what do you have? <laughs> yeah, I want to pick up on what you said, Ty, about um, people having double standards even in your lab. Oh, it's yeah, strange. Definitely. It's strange, isn't it, that there's a big reluctance to admit ignorance. Mm. Yet, if we don't know the answer to something, as a ex-science teacher, I get expected to be able to provide all the answers. And when I say nobody knows yet, they don't take that as acceptable. Yeah. <laughs> and it's weird to me because skepticism is a perfectly valid position to hold. Yep. And if you don't know, it's honourable and honest to say it's so. Intellectually Where's honest. their hang-up? Why don't they accept that? Larry, because how? they have been trained to have to be right. They have been trained to have to have an answer. To right. have to have an answer. Yes, right. Yeah. Yes. Larry, do you want to talk more on that? About having to have an answer? Having to have an I feel like Christianity trains oh, yeah. you to have to have an answer. Not to think right. about an answer, but to have the answer. Well, First Peter three fifteen says, "Always be um, prepared to defend your faith, defend your beliefs," and you know they take that to heart, especially the ones that are um, apologetic or uh, apologists for the re the religion. And so many people pick up that that gauntlet, as it were, that whether it was thrown down or not, that they feel like they have to defend their beliefs. Um, no matter what the answer, how, how outrageous or, or strange the answer is, they feel if they give an answer, they yes. have an answer. Exactly. Which is it's not the same thing as having a valid answer, having an answer that's been vetted or um, uh, proven to be true. So our school systems in America, I don't know how they are in Canada mm -hmm. or in, in Britain, but we have a culture where you are better off being wrong than admitting you don't know. And so it goes down to the classroom where, hey, what's the answer to this math equation? Timmy, give it to me. He's not going to say, I don't know. He's going to be like seven. He's going to make a guess and be wrong. When we have a standardized test, they tell you literally, just guess something on the multiple choice because it's better than leaving it blank, right? Like yes. they encourage you to have an answer, period. And so right. we don't really have opportunities to investigate the value of I don't know until we hit into, you know, upper graduate school where it's like, I don't know is actually the right answer until we have a better test for this. And that's mind blowing level of discomfort to get around if you haven't weren't raised with that idea as a concept or at least that option. John Richards. Yeah, I like to think that there's two things. There's an answer which mm. actually addresses the question and then there's a response, which doesn't. <laughs> okay, and I'll add a third one, if we can have that. We can have a response, we can have an answer, and then we can have an even better thing, an explanation. And the cool thing about an explanation is it may not even have the answer in it, but it does illuminate a lot of aspects of the question that at least helps you understand what is the nature of what we're talking about and what could be the answer down the road. So mm. I, I'm a fan of explanations and I don't know. <clears throat> and I realized a lot of times when I was a Christian, I was getting a lot of answers for things, but I wasn't getting any explanations. And that's what made me right. want to think about like, okay, well, how do these things happen? We don't know yet. That's fine. But I'll at least take the best explanation until then. Let Dr. Five. Well, some explanations are better than others, for, for sure. I like sure. Uh, um, <clears throat> you know, you, you you ask the question to a preacher and he gives you an answer and you ask him for an explanation. He's quite ready to give an explanation and I will listen go to on for, for hours, you know, about the explanation, but it doesn't mean it has anything <clears throat> to do with reality. Yeah. And then there's your, your parents' explanation when you say why, and they say, because I told you to. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, that's not the much of an explanation <laughs> for why. So, uh, you know, no answers and ex some explanations are about in the same ballpark. Yeah, that, yeah, that one's right up there with uh, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, what is it? The, so. the nature of being, how to be a good person, consequences and all that stuff. Like I had a high standard for wanting to know why those were the case. And I wasn't getting 
for my mom to just be like, I don't know, like figure it out, read the Bible or whatever, which is a good response. In the Bible, it'd say, God says, don't eat shellfish. That's how you be a good person. I'm like, there's an answer, but I'm not sure if that explains anything to me. And then when I started getting explanations, they were like convoluted. They were difficult. They were complex. <clears throat> that doesn't mean that they were untrue. It just means I had to hire, heighten my ability to understand different things and how my consequences affected other people. I had to read books on ethics, morality. I had to understand like, Hey, maybe I can define my own purpose in life and, and, and try to get other people's assessments. So I can have a better objective understanding of how to treat people and how I want to be treated. And maybe I don't have the final best model for how to treat people, but I at least have something very reasonable and good. And I found like that is a good enough explanation. That's what I mean by explanation. So you, you find kind of something close. more reasonable. Sure. Yeah. I found a better and I found a better answer, a better explanation, a better response. And mm -hmm. I feel like that's the standard I want to go by. I want to go to a point where I can always improve and always have the standard of evidence that I have meet whatever the claim is that I'm, that I believe or want to stay mm -hmm. true. And if I don't have that, I'm very annoyed. <laughs> if someone sells me anything other, yes. it's a very annoying thing. Cause I don't want to be a hypocrite. Dread Pirate Higgs, where can we find you? What's going on with you? Well, I'm live streaming this right now. It's uh, I started at eight o'clock AM on Sunday morning and specific standard time or daylight time, depending on what season. And I can be found on Mind Pirate, M I N D P Y R A T E, nice. on YouTube. That's my channel. Very, very cool. Did you get 100 subscribers? Me? Okay. Did you get 100 subscribers, my friend? I, I'm at 90. Let's go. He's only Let's 10 go. away, guys. Blow, <laughs> blow this yeah. thing up. All right. Yeah. Well, John hopefully, you know, with now that we're putting the, uh, the link into, uh, Larry's putting the link into the chat room. Uh, We'll get some more viewers and more hey, subscribers. I'll tell you how you do it. You just say that your videos are for kids when you when you upload on YouTube. We'll disable comments, <laughs> but everybody will be able to see it. It's a question of whether you want that or not. John Richards, right. <laughs> future self-proclaimed president. What's going on with you, and where can we find you? <laughs> I don't accept that description. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can find me on Free Thought Productions. That's a YouTube channel. Very where bad. I do my global atheist stream <laughs> and my free thought hour every week goes out on Saturday. I've got a great guest coming up next week. He's an Australian who is a lecturer in chemistry. And he has a lot of He's got a lot of thoughts to say about um, evolution, indeed. So okay, that'll, that'll interesting. be interesting. A chemist who has opinions on evolution. That's interesting. Okay, 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 yeah. okay. I'd love to hear that. Uh, George Brown. Pete's coffee, where can I get a cup? Um, well, you can only, in this state, the only place where I know you can get a cup mm. is, I believe, Nashville. Okay. There is a there is an affiliate store there, but you can you can find Pete's coffee in many supermarkets these days. And I get mine at Ingalls, but I don't get it very often because it's not cheap. Oh, no. This is good stuff. It's good um, stuff. Now, um, anyway... Uh, in this part of the show, I just want to say that you inspired me, a person of a Jewish heritage, to have shrimp for lunch. Nice. <laughs> very, very That's cool. it. Out of me. <laughs> very, very cool. Doubt or five? You'll go to hell. You'll go to hell, George. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the hell you're going to. <laughs> I'm going to go to somebody else's you're hell. Bad. I'd be sorry to do it. <laughs> Yeah. Plot twist, Jews don't believe in hell. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> that five, that five. What do you got? Well, my own content can be found on digitalfreethought.com. Be sure to click on the blog button for our radio show archives, atheist songs, and many articles on the subject. My book is Atheism, What's It All About? It's available on Amazon. And you can find my YouTube channel by searching for Larry Rhodes or Doubter 5. If you have any questions for this show, you can send them to askanatheist at knoxvilleatheist.org and we'll answer them on future shows. And if you're having trouble leaving religious beliefs behind, and it can be hard, you can find help at recoveringfromreligion.org. There you go. There's, the, there's my book. Yay. Thanks, Dredd. If you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe. 
This has been the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. Remember, everybody, including George, is going to somebody else's hell. <laughs> the time to worry about it is when they, <clears throat> excuse me, when they prove that heavens and hells and souls are real. Until then, don't sweat it. Enjoy your life, and we see you next week. Say bye, everybody. Bye, bye, bye everybody. Bye. So I heard a voice in my head that told me atheism was true. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha